a thousand miles. You said that really quick. You're in Antarctica. Yeah, white, desolate, endless, you know, minus 40 degrees, pulling a 375 pound sled behind me all alone. So what I got dropped off with on the edge of that continent, that was all I had to survive that entire time, nearly a thousand mile journey. This is a guy who walked across Antarctica. How many days did it take you? 54 days. By yourself? By myself. Dude, what the f were you doing? This is unbelievable what you've done. This is Colin O'Brady. He's a 10-time world record holding explorer and mountaineer. He's trekked to the North and South Pole. He's climbed every major mountain in the world. And on top of all that, he rode a boat from South America to Antarctica. All in all, he's a total badass. The deeper why, you know, I'm always just really curious about unlocking human potential, uh, finding sort of the depths of the human spirit, my own edges, and then being able to come back from those experiences and share those stories. The one time we're on a Thailand beach at night, you're having fun with people and they're lighting jump ropes on fire. Yeah, I tripped on the rope, the rope wrapped around my leg and let my body completely on fire to my neck. You know, survival mode thankfully kicked in when I needed it most and I jumped into the ocean to extinguish the flames, but not before about 25% of my body was severely burned. The worst part about it, the doctor walked in on about day four or five, something says to me, hey, look, Colin, I hate to tell you this, but you'll probably never walk again. Do you have a favorite world record? <laughs> it's funny. You know, I'm, I'm certainly most, probably most well known for the solo uh, unsupported human power crossing of Antarctica. So a thousand mile journey pulling a 375 pound sled across Antarctica. But one that does Hold on, hold on. You said that really quick. So it's like you're in Antarctica. So already I'm picturing like ice, snow, minus 40 degree temperatures, penguins maybe hopping around or whatnot. But you're you're walking across a continent that no one lives on pulling a sled completely alone. Is, is that right? Uh, you got you, you painted the perfect picture. Minus, uh, there, there's not so many penguins on the interiors of, of the oh, continent. No. So once okay. I get, you know, in there closer, they pretty much stick to the coast. So uh, once I got, got going, there was, there was no penguins in sight. But other than that, you uh, painted the perfect picture, pretty much white, desolate, endless, white, you know, minus 40 degrees, pulling a 375 pound sled behind me all alone. And uh, yeah, unsupported means no resupplies of food or fuel. So what I got dropped off with on the edge of that continent, that was was all I had to survive um, that entire time, nearly a thousand mile journey. Um, and no one had ever completed that crossing before. A thousand miles. And it takes like weeks, right? I was out there for 54 days. Yeah, 54 <laughs> days. A, a thousand miles, 54 days alone. Just you and a sat phone and, and a sled that's getting lighter and lighter, I guess, because you're eating all your food. Yeah, slightly, but, you know, very incrementally at first, you know, I could barely pull the thing 375 pounds is uh, ridiculous. And still in that, I couldn't pack nearly enough food. So even on day one, I was on a 3000 calorie deficit. So I was about, you know, burning 10,000 calories a day, only had enough room in my sled to carry about 7,000 calories per day, which sounds like a lot. But when you're in the middle of Antarctica working that hard, I basically was starving from, from day one, lost a lot of weight. Okay. So I have so I have a million questions about this, but I interrupted because I asked what your favorite uh, world record was, and you were saying, "Well, I'm most well known for this." Were you taking but, me towards like, but no, my but, favorite but actually, one yeah, was something favorite, else? Favorite one is something that I, I I don't you know not everyone knows me so well for, but it was a project that I did in 2018. I set the speed record for climbing the tallest mountain in each of the 50 U.S. states. So tallest mountain in each state, 50 states. And I did all of that in 21 days. So it was, uh, you do the math on that, a few states per day. The logistics were crazy. Um, and I just had an amazing team of friends around me supporting it from, you know, commercial flights to private plane to an RV that we put 10,000 miles on and all this sort of coordinating of these logistics and running up these mountains in rapid succession. I had slept an average of like two hours per day and every 24 hour, hour period. It was just a blast, man. We also, via social media, I had invited people. I just said, Hey, follow my route. And if you're, you know, you live in Arkansas, if you live in Louisiana, wherever you live, like come meet me at the trailhead, I'm going to be here roughly around this time. So people from all over the country met me in various segments. Some people, you know, hiked a mile with me, you know, obviously I wasn't like necessarily slowing down, but I met all sorts of different people. <laughs> you're, like, you're like, keep up or, or I'm out of here. Cause I'm on a schedule. Right? Exactly. But that was, uh, you know, I don't know. It's hard to say favorites. Um, that's certainly not the most death defying, um, and headline catching, but it was definitely one of my all time favorites. Just had a blast doing that project. When you say that, so you did, you did what in three weeks you hit 50 States. Yeah, exactly. So that reminds me of, uh, we had James Lawrence, Iron Cowboy on the yeah. podcast and, you know, he did 101 <laughs> uh, iron type triathlons um, in like 101 days. And we had Sean Swarner on the podcast who has completed the uh, 
Expedition Cup, Explorers Cup. Yeah, he's done the Explorers Grand Slam. I think he was the first person Grand with Slam. the cancer stand. I actually have the world record for the Explorers Grand Slam, so I'm the fastest ever <laughs> completed. Um, I love how competitive you guys are. No, no, no. He's so, a friend. He's a nice guy. I really like him. And James as well is a really great guy. Uh, Aaron but, Cowboy. Yeah. It's like, but it's um, I, I do have questions because and mainly my question is like, why? Like, why, <laughs> why do you do this to yourself? <laughs> well, I know that you, your podcast is, is talking to a lot of entrepreneurs and, and creatives and things like that. You know, for me, what I've realized over time is, is my pursuits are, are no different than that. You know, I'm taking an, an idea uh, that has never been created or taking an idea that exists and, and improving it. But like the solo crossing of Antarctica, or I was the first person also row a boat across Drake Passage. These are things that no one had ever done them before. And so the create, you know, my creative expression, my, I guess, is in endurance sports on the edge of the world, but it really is a creative expression and trying to, you know, there's a lot that goes into planning and preparing and figuring out all the details and, and essentially creating something that doesn't exist and hoping to, you know, excel at it at the highest, highest level with certain life and death stakes and things like that. So I think, I think we all press our own creativity in different ways. And for me, it's through this medium. And there certainly is an entire entrepreneurial and business side to building and creating these things to make themselves sustaining and, um, you know, worthwhile in that way. But it's, uh, you know, for me that the deeper why, you know, certainly has to do with, you know, I'm always just really curious about unlocking human potential, finding sort of the the depths of the the human spirit, my own edges, and then being able to come back from those experiences and, and share those stories. You know, whether that's in, you know, film and and Hollywood production. You know, whether that's through my you know two best selling books that I've written. You know, I love the opportunity to be able to share those lessons, not from a standpoint of oh hey look at me I did this tell me you know pat me on the back and tell me how cool I am, but more through the lens of I think as humans. You know, we all have reservoirs of untapped potential. We all have, you know, places in our mind and, and within ourselves that we can tap and improve on. And it's fun to be able to share some stories and things that I've learned in a way that people can hopefully uh, take lessons into their own lives and, and build and create whatever they're dreaming up in their own lives. I, I almost feel like at this point in your career, you need like a bunch of scraps of paper and uh, three different buckets. And you need to be like, one, one bucket has to have locations. Another bucket has to have uh, like different things like a rowboat or without shoes or a tricycle or something. And then the last bucket has to be some kind of weird challenge or time thing. And then you're going to just go to the hat or the buckets and you're going to be like, okay, I'm going to, oh, it looks like Australia. And I'm going to cross uh, in 13 days on a tricycle. Like I feel like, <laughs> like that's yeah, love, a bit of what's... <laughs> I love this. Uh, maybe that's, that, that's how I'll dream up my next project. It'll be uh, <laughs> through, through that lens. I like it. You know, just uh, a, a random Mad Libs draw. <clears throat> yeah, like have some fun. Maybe, maybe you can get the audience to vote on it or whatnot. But, but like, and I can't even rhyme off everything you've done, but you climbed every major mountain. You talked about these 50 states. Uh, you've gone to the South Pole. You've gone to the North Pole. You've, you've broken all these world records. But it all kind of started for you, if I understand right, because you got into triathlons, because when you were younger, you were like injured on a trip. Uh, what happened with that? Yeah. So after graduating from college, I, most of my friends, so I had a economics degree from Yale, but I was a public school kid from Portland, Oregon. So when I got out there, it was a, a bit of a culture shock, great education, but everyone was like, well, of course I'm going to become an investment banker. I'm going to become a consultant. And these were like jobs and careers I'd literally never even heard of growing up. So maybe that prevented me from, you know, being like, that must be the only path. Cause so many of my classmates certainly thought that I never traveled. Uh, my family didn't have a lot of money when I was a kid. And so I always just dreamed of having an adventure, seeing a little bit more of the world before settling into a career of some kind. And so I painted houses every single summer since I was 16. And every summer I put aside, you know, a couple thousand dollars um, and said, when I graduate, hopefully I'll have enough money to buy like a cheap student fare plane ticket, travel around the world and see, you know, spread my wings a little bit. And so that's exactly what I did. I had very little money. I think I had $10,000 saved up and I was trying to plan a trip for an entire year to live off that. So that meant, you know, hitchhiked around New Zealand, slept on people's floors that I would meet, you know, try to sleep at youth hostels with, you know, 16 bunk beds per room, you know, just enough money in my pocket to have a couple beers at the end of the night or whatever, surfed through Australia, went up through Southeast Asia. And then as you pointed out, yeah, I found myself on this beach in rural Thailand in a small island called Koh Tao. And there's uh, these guys setting up a flaming jump rope. So they lit this jump rope on fire with kerosene. 
and I'm 22 years old at the time, you know, I guess I didn't have a fully formed prefrontal cortex, but I just thought, gee, this looks like fun. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Were you, were you enjoying the drinks maybe a little bit on the beach? <laughs> you know, it's no? funny. I, you know, I partied a lot throughout that trip at this moment. It actually, in truth, I was dead sober. I had just done my, <laughs> <laughs> which is of course, sweet irony. The one time yeah. <laughs> we're on a Thailand beach at night, you're, you're having fun with people and they're lighting <laughs> jump ropes on fire. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, I was doing my scuba diving certification. So we weren't really partying. We we're just like, oh, okay, you know, having dinner or whatever. And basically they light this rope on fire and turn into like a jump rope. Like, you know, like two, you know, like you do as a kid, not a little jump rope, like a big, like a 20 foot long rope. And I jumped under that rope and it went pretty wrong for me pretty quickly. I tripped on the rope, the rope wrapped around my legs and let my body completely on fire to my neck, you know, survival mode, thankfully kicked in when I needed it most. And I jumped into the ocean to extinguish the flames but not before about 25% of my body was severely burned, predominantly my legs and feet. You know, I didn't uh, have any way of, uh, um, you know, getting to a proper hospital. I was in an island on the Gulf of Thailand. So instead of an ambulance, I had a moped ride on a dirt path to like this one room nursing shack. I underwent eight surgeries in rural Thailand um, where there was like a cat running around my bed and across my chest in the makeshift like ICU when I would come out of surgery. And, um, you know, the, the worst part about it certainly was a very physically painful, but the doctor walked in on about day four or five, something like that. He says to me, Hey, look, Colin, I hate to tell you this, but you'll probably never walk again normally. Um, they thought that the, my ligaments, my uh, ligaments were so badly damaged that I would really never gain full mobility back in my ankles and my knees and stuff like that. They thought I would be handicapped in some capacity given how badly I was burned. So yeah, it was a, it was a tough moment for me to say the least. It, it's, it's interesting to me because the people that I speak to who, who go into I don't think I don't, expeditions isn't the right word. Just this like extreme, <laughs> what, what would you say? Extreme adventurism? How would you describe yourself? Yeah. I mean, I think explore adventure. Um, but, you know, to, to me, it, it's become so much more of just, you know, of course, the external world. Where can I go? What mountain can I see? And again, North Pole, South Pole, as you mentioned. But I think it is ultimately a, a journey into the mind, right? And journey into exploring the human psyche. And really through that, you know, experience, you know, being told I would never walk again normally was uh, really massive blow. Um, I just remember the sinking feeling like, wow, you know, what have I done? It's my, and of course it was just oh, entirely my fault. It wasn't like an accident. It was like, you're an idiot. You know, you did this to yourself basically. And the kind of heroine of the story is my mother, you know, she, she arrived to the to Thai hospital on the fifth day or something like that. And uh, I can only imagine what it's like to be a mother and see your kid in the state. You know, she tells me now that she was like, you know, crying in the hallways, pleading with for, for good news from the doctors. But she actually never showed me that fear. She, instead, she came into my hospital room every single day with this huge smile on her face and this air of positivity, kind of daring me to dream about the future. And, um, you know, I call this this concept now, I call it a, a possible mindset. I call it that in my new book, The 12 Hour Walk. And I define that as, an empowered way of thinking that unlocks life of limitless possibilities. You know, she's effectively daring me to dream without limits. Forget what the doctor said. You know, what do you want to do when you get out of here? Let's set a goal. And I closed my eyes. She kind of walked me through a visualization. I opened my eyes. I said, like, I don't want to tell you what I saw. And she's like, no, no, tell me. I was like, that sounds ridiculous. I said, you know, I pictured myself crossing the finish line of a triathlon. And which, which is, which is, I mean, given your condition, <laughs> Is ridiculous. <laughs> right. And I, I, you know, I half expected her to be like, yeah, I said, set a goal, but like, you know, uh, maybe something more realistic, your legs. I mean, I'm literally in a Thai hospital bed, bandaged from the waist down, doctor time and not going to walk in. I'm like, I might do a triathlon. No, but instead she was like, great, you're going to do that. In fact, I can already see you doing that. Um, and she calls is over this, to the, is this typical of your mom? Like she's like super optimistic, super outgoing. We can yeah. do anything. Let's set some goals. Like certainly then have been a big, big influence in that way for sure. And it, you know, she actually says, Hey doc. And she calls over the Thai doctor says, my son's tra training for a triathlon. He needs some weights. And so I have this picture of me literally lifting, you know, 10 pound dumbbells in a Thai hospital with my you know body bandaged from the waist down. And there's a picture of this Thai doctor looking at me, like someone needs to knock some sense in this stupid American kid. I'm like, doc, I'm training for a triathlon. He's like, you're, you're out of your freaking mind. And, you know, you know, fast forward to the end of the story basically is, you know, I was in the Thai hospital for a couple of months. I was uh, you know, carried on and off the plane. I was in a wheelchair when I got home and you know, slowly had to learn how to walk again and then eventually walk around my block and jog. And I eventually wanted to get out of my parents' basement and move on with my life. So I did move to Chicago um, and took a job as a commodities trader there and signed up for the Chicago triathlon. 
And 18 months after I was burned in the fire, 18 months after being told I would never walk again normally, I you know started the race. I, I swam in Lake Michigan a mile. I rode 25 miles down Lake Shore Drive and got my running shoes on and ran 6.2 miles and I crossed the finish. You know, I, I had done it, but in my sort of complete and utter surprise is when I looked up at the scoreboard, I hadn't actually just finished the race but I actually won the entire Chicago triathlon placing first out of nearly, you know, I don't know, 5,000 participants or so on the day. Um, and yeah. Which is like, I don't know. It's just, it's a banana story, man. Like that you could be that hurt and then spend so much time grinding through. What was it? Was it just the hope? What was it that got you through month after month of training to, to just cross the finish line? But then like, honestly, did you just like totally overtrain because you were so dedicated? How did you win this thing? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I honestly didn't even know I won it. You know, that certainly was not on my radar at all. Um, it was mostly just this desire to, to get back on my feet, you know, quite literally. And it's looking back, realizing that in this Thai hospital, in this moment of adversity, there was a sliding doors moment, you know, it's like turn to the left and who knows where my life would be or I'd lean into my mother's positivity. And here I am. And to me, the essence of that, you know, extrapolated for myself moving forward, but certainly for others, is I think as humans, we all have these, as I said, reservoirs of untapped potential to achieve extraordinary things. And life is hard. We are going to face setbacks, you know, whether those are self-imposed limitations, whether those are, you know, tragedies that befall any of us, you know, we lo losing, you know, death of a family member, a heartbreak, you know, they, you know, getting fired from your job, like, you know, hard things happen. I don't care who you are. Like no one's impervious to having some, some tough moments in life. But I realized that in these moments, we have a choice. We have an ability to choose, you know, how am I going to react to that? How am I going to move forward from that? And realizing that that possible mindset, that belief in limitless possibilities when facing adversity is really incredibly powerful and uplifting and the ability to shift into that, um, yeah, I think can, can really be a game changer. I, I think, I think you mentioned you become a professional triathlete, triathlon, yeah, triathlete, athlete, yeah. triathlete, yeah. triathlete. Um, how, how does, where does the, the seed get planted to go from like, this is what I do. I run these triathlons. I'm super athletic. I'm super cool. I'm awesome. To like, I'm going to go climb some mountains or I'm going to go to the South Pole or like, uh, like how does one take the leap from that to what yeah. you've built a career doing? Yeah. So I raced triathlon professionally for about seven years, um, you know, 25 countries, six different which, continents which all by, over the by world. Which by the way, is already a pretty cool profession. Yeah. Like yeah, the fact that you can love doing that and you can make a living spending your time traveling the world, running these races and stuff. That's pretty badass. Yeah, it was great. You know, it was a great chapter in my life. You know, spent most of my twenties doing that. You know, for me, I always dreamed of climbing Mount Everest, you know, ever since I was a kid. So I grew up in Portland, Oregon. I don't know if you folks that have been there, you can see Mount Hood from the city limits. So you can see this kind of snow capped peak. Granted, it's only 11,000 feet and Everest is 29,000 feet, but it's a beautiful, big snowy volcano. And I learned to, to climb mountains when I was a kid uh, there, you know, not, not anything like super, you know, impressive or anything like that, but, you know, basic technique with crampons, ice axe, you know, a little bit of technical mountaineers, ropes and stuff like that. But more than anything, I just loved it. And, you know, as a kid, I was always, you know, like, I remember being like, you know, was really young, like, what's the tallest mountain in the world? Where is it? You know, what's it like? And then as I got a little bit older, I remember reading books about Mount Everest, um, you know, when I was, a you know, early in high school or, you know, eighth grade or something like that is when John Krakauer's book Into Thin Air came out, which is a very famous memoir about a tragedy uh, on Everest, actually a, a book about eight people dying on Everest. And maybe there's something wrong with my personality, but that book was, I was like, as a book. Yeah. yeah. I would, I mean, one in four people don't survive, I think is the stat. And it's like, yeah, I, th I think there might be something wrong with you. <laughs> yeah. So usually that, that book is like a cautionary tale of like, why not to go over there for me? Because I was like, wow, you can get people actually can climb this mountain and you know, that can be done. So it was just a, a seed that was sowed in early childhood, but it was in the back of my mind. You know, Everest is obviously far away, remote, um, and it's very expensive to, to climb. And so uh, the logistics are very complicated. So it was just one of those things like, you know, one day I'd like to do this, but I think as my you know strength grew as an athlete, as I continued to push myself, my mind, body, and spirit as a professional triathlete, uh, that goal was still there. And, and things that maybe at one point seemed out of reach started thinking like, well, if I can go from not walking again to racing this triathlon, becoming a professional triathlete, what else could I achieve if I set my mind to it? And that's really, um, in, in 2015 and into 2016, when I set myself the goal of completing what we talked about briefly before the, the Explorers Grand Slam. 
So that's to climb the tallest mountain on each of the seven continents. So there's known as the seven summits. That's Everest, Kilimanjaro, Denali, North America. So the tallest mountain on each continent, as well as complete expeditions to both the North Pole and, and the South Pole. And I didn't want to just complete it, um, but I set myself the goal of setting the world record for it. So becoming the fastest person um, to complete that consecutively. And ultimately in 2016, I uh, yeah completed that in 139 days, nonstop, place to place to place. But you know, backing up from that a little bit, you know, which is, I think, pertinent to this audience is when I had the goal, when I had the dream, uh, my wife and I had just gotten engaged and I, you know, we set this goal together. My wife's been my business partner and just, you know, been in the weeds with all the things that we've built and created over time. We had like 10 grand in the bank. And that was like our full life savings. And this project itself was going to cost half a million dollars. Like it's just very expensive and it's complicated. The North Pole and South Pole logistics are complicated. I mean, it's just like, it's not like a thing you can just like do. In that moment, I remember being like, I want to do this. But I realize now that like people have these all sorts of lofty dreams, but then like quote unquote, like reality hits them. It's like, I mean, yeah. say you're like drinking beers with a buddy on a Saturday night. You're like we should run the New York city marathon next year, like whatever. And you wake up hungover on Sunday and you're like, yeah, man, I was just talking shit. Like, uh, you know, we're not going to actually like, do that, you know, or even, you know, much, much larger goals. Like let's start this business. It's going to be great. And blah, blah. And you wake up on Monday morning. You're like, yeah, like we don't know how to do this. We don't know how to take the first step. We don't have this. Like that's us this moment. Like we have no money, no resources. Paul, this, is, this is so interesting to me because everyone in your situation who've done badass things, they never seem to talk about like, Hey, I have 10 grand. This thing I want to do is going to cost half a million. How do we make it happen? Like everyone glosses over this part of the story. So, so tell me, how did you make this happen? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, it to me is in a lot of ways, I mean, of course I love the adventure and the experiences and the climbing of the mountains and the end result of that is powerful. But the, the how of that is, is really, is really kind of how do you, you know, turn your dreams into reality. Um, and in my newest book, I, I write an entire, so the book is broken down into these limiting beliefs that I think we all have. It's, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. What if I fail? You know, what, what if, um, you know, I like being uncomfortable. What if people criticize me? And so each chapter is broken down and the chapter that's about money, uh, I tell this story. And, you know, it, it's this idea that we have, we, you know, we, we need to raise $500,000. We have $10,000 to our name. And also to, to comp compound that we have, I have, it's not like I'm a professional mountaineer. It's not like I have some like amazing track record in the thing that I'm like trying to do. We're like, okay, well, we need to get sponsorship. My wife says to me, she's like, well, first of all, if you're ever going to raise that kind of money, you need to look the part. Meaning like you need, now this is 26, 16, like you got to have a website. You got to have like marketing materials. You got to have like a brand of some kind that like tells the story of your why. And our deeper purpose for this was with triathlon, my reach was somewhat limited to a very small community of, of triathletes. Um, whereas we thought that this project at global scale had much more significant reach. And we had this passion around inspiring young people to go after their childhood dreams. For me, that was Everest. So, you know, we wanted to start a nonprofit to really inspire young people. Uh, just a caveat or a side, sidebar to that is, you know, we had no idea how to start a nonprofit either. <laughs> Um, no, there's, it's actually quite complicated 501c3 and all these rules and your board and all this sort of stuff. But that was also something we had no experience with, but I'm proud to say at this point, you know, it's eight years into the future or whatever, um, you know, we've had more than a million students enrolled in our nonprofit, uh, programs, but in this moment we had none of that. And we, um, basically she says, let's go to a creative agency, build a badass website. So we walked into a creative agency and we're basically like, here's our idea. We want to do this. This is all the money we have. What can huh. you do for us? And quite honestly, you know, as you well know, ten thousand dollars doesn't actually get you very much at like a proper creative agency. <laughs> I, I own a creative agency. Yeah, like, I know. Really that, that, like you guys are pot committed at that point. Um, though. You're like, we're like, this is everything that we have. And you know, fortunately, this creative agency was basically like, okay. We can do a little, you know, obviously they, they, they figured it out in a way to do a little bit of pro bono work for us, you know, we get paid, but we can pay and they helped us build, um, you know, uh, a brand and a website and a promo video. And, you know, this, this dates the story a little bit, but we actually like printed out some like actual printed materials to like hand to people. That was our plan. And I remember at one point going like, but Jenna is my wife's name. I'm like, but what if no one says yes? Like we've spent all of our money on this website. That's like, it's not a website that does anything. It's just a website that like tells and explains an idea. And yeah. she basically is like, well, I guess we'll have a cool website. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it's just like, um, but you know, you have to back yourself at some point, right? You have to commit to this. And that's what we did. We really went full steam ahead. Like, this is what we're doing. 
So and you weren't you weren't really betting on the website or the creative agency or the idea or any of those things. You're were, you're were actually just betting on yourself. Yeah, and being like, we're gonna figure this out, and we think that this is the pathway to doing this in some capacity, right? And I think it's interesting in, in, in sharing this with other you know entrepreneurs and creatives who are, are listening in on this right now. There's something powerful about putting an idea that's very clear out into the world, right? Like it's like it's one thing to like talk to you and your friend, or I'm think, kind of thinking about this, or whatever. It's very different to be like, I'm doing this. I am doing this. And by putting up a website that had this clear idea, this brand, it wasn't like, I'm thinking about maybe one day doing this. It's like, we're doing this, right? You had to have that sort of um, commitment to it. And then that forced me, like once the website was live to be like, cool. So who can I like go meet with about this? And I, I took every random freaking meeting that you could possibly ever take, literally ever. Like I would, you know, stalk people on LinkedIn. Someone would be like, my friend of my friend of my friend works at Intel and the whatever thing division. Like, great. Can I meet that person? Can I go to this? this? Like, and what mostly happened is people just said, no, like we just like over and over. No, I can't help you. Or maybe, oh, this, I have nothing to do with this, but I could maybe email another guy for a long while. We didn't get, we didn't get very far. Um, in terms of actually raising any money. We did get an end to Columbia Sportswear because I live in Portland, Oregon. So Columbia Sportswear is headquartered there. We did eventually through like, you know, literally five different steps of this guy who knew this person or this person. Da, da, da. We actually got to the CEO of Columbia Sportswear and had a meeting. And in two minutes into the meeting, the CEO was like, looks at us kind of like, how did you get on my schedule? <laughs> and we just got like, yeah, just got like, oh, ouch. It was sort of like, oh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So, wrapping the, you know, literally like a couple minutes in, and my wife is like, you're missing it. Um, and again, I, re- I write this story uh, in, in my first book, The Impossible First, but, you know, she convinces him the meeting to, to hear us out. And he eventually does provide a little bit of sponsorship, but we're still, we're still hundreds of thousands of dollars short. And we're, I'm, I'm announcing that I'm leaving in one month. Like we had set a date because there's a specific time when you need to go to Antarctica. Like there's a certain sequence to this expedition. And when we had started this, it had been a year and a half out. And now we were a month out and we a were several out. hundred yeah. thousand dollars short. And she looks at me, she goes, you only have enough money to do the first expedition. Then you're going to have to come home. Like, it, you know, it, we just like don't have money. And I'd also been out speaking to school kids at this point, telling them about this and you can follow along because we're getting the nonprofit, you know, stuff up and running. And there's a part of me, that's like not feeling like a fraud as if I'm lying to them. Like, but I was just <laughs> going to ask, how did you not feel like a liar? Cause but there's because like this, this, is, this is what we have to do. We have to put out to the world, like confidence, confidence, confidence It's going to happen. It's going to come together. The universe will bring it together. Don't worry. Everything's fine. And you come home and you lay there at night and you go, <laughs> I just told I'm a bunch a, of I'm second a graders liar. I'm doing this. Like, uh, who, what's wrong with you, right? So, a buddy of mine who who knows that I've you know he's, that I've been working really hard on this, he says to me, he goes, "Hey, Colin, I want you to come to a spin class with me at the local LA Fitness." And I'm a professional athlete. I'm like, "What are you?" I'm like, "Bro, I'm a professional athlete." I'm not, you know, that ego is getting better. Like, you want me to go to a random group fitness class at like LA fitness on a Sunday morning? I'm like, dude, no. He's like, yeah, yeah. There's this woman I want you to meet. She's super cool. She actually set a world record like in the seventies. I just think you'll think she's cool. Like what do you, what do you got to lose? Like come meet her. And I was like, fine, man, whatever. And so I walk in a spin class. He introduced me to this woman. Um, she's probably in her mid fifties. She's already like crank the spin class hasn't even started, but she's like cranking on her bike already. She's like tripping and like she's been in there a half hour, like before the class starts. She's like clearly pretty badass. And introduced me, you know, my buddy, Angelo, he says, you know, Colin, meet Kathy, Kathy Colin, and, you know, shake her hand. And he goes, yeah, she, she is a world record holder. Tell her about it. He's just like, oh, that's a million years ago. But turns out she set the world record for the 5k in running, uh, in the seventies when she was in college. And I was like, wow, that's super cool. And he goes, now tell her you're trying to set a world record. Like, tell her about it. And I just give her like the 30 second, you know, I'm like pitching her. I'm just like, I'm trying to climb these mountains. Like my goal is to do this so that I can start this nonprofit, da, 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 like whatever. And she's like, wow, cool. Good luck with that. Right. Spin, spin class starts. I think to myself, like, I'm in a freaking spin class in LA fitness. Like, what, am I, what am I doing? And, you know, I do the workout. It's fine. And I'm getting ready to go. You know, everyone like wipes the sweat off their bikes and whatever at the end of the spin class. And she waves me back over and she's like, oh, Colin, it's so great to meet you. I was thinking about it the whole class. That's so cool what you're trying to do. I'm wishing you the best. And she goes, my husband loves this kind of stuff too. He's right over there. You should meet him. And she waves over this guy. This guy walks over. I didn't realize her husband was there. They weren't like even sitting next to each other in the, in the class. And he's like, oh, hey, what's up? I shake his hand. And again, this like, she goes, tell him. And I just 30, this 30 second, just like quick, you know, 
to the point, this is what I'm doing. You know, speech comes out about what I'm doing. And he looks at me, he's like, wow, this is amazing. I love this. And he goes, are you happen to be looking for sponsors by any chance? And I'm like, well, as a matter of fact, I am. And he, he goes, um, he goes, cause the company I work with, a company I work for, I think could be pretty interested in this. And I'm like, wow, great. Where do you work? And he goes, I work at Nike. And I'm like, you know, uh, like, yeah. yeah, amazing. Right. And I, you know, I live in, and I think that's like kind of any athlete's dream scenario, but I live in Portland, Oregon. So like, you know, it's the home of Nike. So it's like, you know, the, the place to be for that. And I'm like, oh my God, like amazing. And he goes, uh, let me get you a card. A uh, business card out of my bag. Do you have a website or something? Uh, I have he, a badass it, website. <laughs> it's like <laughs> funny you should mention that. I do have a yes, I do have a website. He's like, just email me on Monday, and like you know, maybe we can talk a little bit further about this. And he hands me his business card, and I look down. I look at the business card, and it says, "Mark Parker, CEO, Nike." I'm talking to the CEO of Nike what? in a, a fitness class, <laughs> LA Fitness, um, on a random Sunday, and. You know, again, you know, I frame this. I, I guess I said I tell this story in my book, The Twelve Hour Walk, to talk about this. I don't have enough money, limiting belief, and the the cynical viewpoint on this is great. You got super lucky. You met the CEO of Nike, and he sponsored your project, and you got to do it. I mean, that that's some, certainly some percentage of people are going to have that viewpoint. That's not the way that I choose to look at this story. You know, I, my, I wouldn't look at it that way either. <laughs> my my mom, and I love this phrase. I don't think she made it up, but she certainly said it to me hundreds of times. She's like, luck comes to those who are prepared. And it's like, did I just get lucky? Well, no. Like, here's the thing. The thousand times that I got told no, unbeknownst to me, what was I doing? I was working on my pitch. I was getting reps in. So that when somebody, even that I had no idea that I was quote unquote pitching, I had a concise and cohesive message that I could spit out in 30 seconds, an elevator pitch of sorts, right? And it was polished because of all the times I got told no. And because of my willingness to keep knocking on doors and getting doors slammed in my face and trying things and evolving and all this kind of stuff. And the same thing is with the website. It's like we spent all of our money, you know, almost a year before that on building this website so that at some point, if the right person happened to ask us for a website, it wasn't like, oh, hold on, let me go build a website and I'll send that to you in a month. It's like, yes, Monday, follow up, boom, da, 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 da. things align. You know, we get the funding, we get the sponsorship. Um, and, you know, I set my first two world records with this and, you know, here I am today. And so uh, to me, it's, it's this, it's this shift. And I'm sure you've talked about this plenty on your show, you know, this shift between scarcity and abundance, this belief in your energy, moving something in momentum forward towards whether that's raising money, but just the abundance in general, the abundance belief that you can do, that you have that possible mindset that you can achieve the things you set out to, but it's not like a get rich quick scheme. It's not like a silver bullet. It's like that abundance only comes from actually taking that action relentlessly with clarity, with clarity of purpose. But I do fundamentally believe that all of us um, have the capacity to build and, and curate our dreams. But it, it takes that, like I said, it takes the thousand doors getting slammed in your face before the one, one, one opens sometimes. In that story, which I love so much, uh, I hear commitment, uh, vision, dedication, uh, and all of those things for sure. But but also I have to imagine that there's a certain amount of the perseverance and the putting yourself in a position where you feel like shit most of the time. I have to believe that whatever pushes you to like walk across Antarctica or climb a mountain or do triathlons, like just the willingness to keep going, to persevere, to push through, is that what makes you a better business person? Or was this learned? Is this just innate to you? You know, we talked about it briefly, but you know, this Antarctica crossing was 54 days alone, minus 40 degrees. I was starving. Um, and I was actually ended up racing this British military badass dude head to head. Um, unbeknownst to us, we both planned our project for the exact same time. So it was like, we were both trying to race history, but also was ended up being a head to head race. And he kicked my ass in the first week. I fortunately overtook him on the sixth day and um, managed to get to the finish line first. Um, become the first person in history to make this crossing after this long lineage of people attempting it. And I was standing there 
Uh, there's actually, believe it or not, there's a post that the U.S. Geological Survey pounded in at the edge of the Antarctica continent, marking the end of the landmass and the beginning of some of the frozen ice shelf and the frozen ocean, basically. 54 days And for in, people who don't know what that is, like Antarctica is like land, but then there's so much frozen ice that the shelf is like, you can keep walking on quote unquote, like it's not land anymore. You're now walking over frozen ocean. ocean. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Frozen ocean. So it'd be, you know, frozen salt water basically versus, you know, terraforma, but yeah. And then obviously at different times of year, those ice shelves are, are bigger or smaller. And of course, over time, right you now, climate change is, you know, issues with melting. That's a whole, that's a whole different podcast, but um, I get to this point where there's a post again, that marks the end of the landmass. And that's what, what I was attempting to cross this is the full, full landmass, the full terraforma there. Yeah, there's lots of pictures of me and video that I took, but you get to paint a picture, you know, I've lost, you know, 30, 40, 50 pounds. I don't know exactly how much I've got frostbite on my face and cheeks. I'm like just completely beat up and exhausted. And I touched this post and I become the first person in history to do this. There's nobody there. Like I'm still alone by myself. I called my family on a sat phone, you know, to celebrate with them. But, you know, I'm, I'm crying tears of joy. And it, it's a really, you know, beautiful moment for me. And, you know, come to think about life, in that moment on a scale of one to 10. So, you know, one being our lowest low moments in life, right? There's, you know, getting burned in a fire, being told you'd never walk again normally, or having your heart broken, or like I said, losing a family member, you know, one, you know, we experience ones throughout our life. And then for me, this moment at this post in Antarctica was a 10. You know, I touched this post and it's a 10, it's a high, high, I've worked so hard. This is a culmination of so many things throughout my life to get me to this point uh, of this massive achievement. And that I really was passionate, you know, pursuing for so long. And I get there and it's a 10. And I'm standing there and I'm thinking, this is a peak moment. But I think about 10s, you know, that's a peak moment for me. But whether that's, you know, uh, the birth of your first child or falling in love or if people that love to ski, like skiing perfect powder, surfing the perfect way, whatever, these 10s, these high highs that we all want to achieve. We all want 10s. And you know, I think it's pretty clear, like who doesn't want more of that in their life? So I'm standing here at the edge of this post. I realized that my ones and my tens are connected. That I didn't get there, this 10, in spite of my ones or from hedging against the ones, but it was actually because embracing the ones. I got there because I was willing to go into Antarctica and feel minus four degrees in my face and starve and be in pain and, and have it be difficult. And I realized that in our modern society, it's so easy to hedge against the ones and just live a life um, between the four and the six range right? Uh, we're, we're what I call the zone of comfortable complacency. It's like you go to a job every day. You don't love it. You don't hate it. It's just a five every day, five, 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 or you're in a relationship, you know, you're living together. It's fine. It's not like toxic or abusive, but it's just, you're cohabitating. There's not a lot of passion there, whatever. It's just a five every single day, but we're so afraid of having that one that we just stick there. We, we rack up 365 days in a row, fives, 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 fives. You know, people ask me all the time, they say, Colin, you've done all these risky things that you could die, whatever, Colin, are you afraid of dying? And I said, you know, the last thing I want to do is die. But what I'm more afraid of is not living, is not fully living. And what I realized is to have those peak arcs, those tens, you have to have that full tapestry, that full uh, pendulum swing from the ones all the way to the tens. And so to your, your initial question, which is, is it about grit? Is it about perseverance? Is it about going through it? I've learned over time that when I'm feeling those one moments, when I'm trying to raise that money and the 999th person has slammed a door in my face and I'm disappointed and I'm losing sleep and I'm upset or I'm feeling these frozen you know, uh, you know, know, temperatures on my face in the middle of Antarctica, I smile because I'm embracing the ones. I'm like, you know what? This, because I'm allowing myself this one right now, it is opening up the door. It's actually creating the possibility for this peak arc, for this 10. And so I think that the reframe on that is incredibly powerful and potent for me, certainly. And does that reframe come on reflection? Because I know when you did this trip, day one, you couldn't pull the sled. Day one, you don't think you can do it. Day one, you call your wife crying, saying, I can't even do this thing. That's got to be a one moment. Totally. On, on day one, the final steps is a 10. But do you, have you just learned this upon reflection or do you, can you recognize it in the moment and, and do the reframe and, and actually pull yourself out of that one low? Yeah. I mean, I think over time I've been able to, to have, you know, of course you learn these things, you know, retrospectively, you know, even with the burn accident, you know, I, it's still at this point, you know, I wouldn't wish the, 
the pain of the burn accident on my worst enemy. And it was horrible. It was horrible for me, my family, you know, it, it, a lot of pain, a lot of physical pain, a lot of emotional pain. But I've also been asked, you know, Colin, if you had a time machine, you could go back and you could whisper in your 22 year old ear while you're sitting on that, you know, it's like, Hey man, don't jump the flaming rope. Like you're going to let your body on fire. Would you go back in a time machine and tell well, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't be doing anything. The things you're doing now, correct. Probably be some investment banker. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so it's a weird thing to say. It's like, on one hand, I wouldn't wish that pain on my worst enemy. On the other hand, I learned some of life's greatest lessons and certain what has made me stronger through that adversity, through, through recovering. So at this point in my life, I can recognize those one moments when they're happening and breathe through them and go like, okay, this sucks. Like this sucks, but this is what it is to be alive, to actually feel the full spectrum. And wouldn't you rather this than just another five day? I mean, I tell people who, you know, and I think we, we know, you know, I think everyone knows a lot of folks who are kind of just in that zone of comfortable complacency. And you ask somebody who's living that kind of a life, you know, what'd you do last Tuesday? What'd you do a month ago? What'd you do three weeks ago? What'd you do a year ago? And it's crazy. Like not a lot is imprinting, you know, it's just because it's like, I don't know, man, it was just like another day. Like you look back on your whole year and there might be a couple of moments that stand out. Um, and it's not to say I'm trying to live in extremes, like only ones and tens. Do you have to be in the five sometimes? Absolutely. That's where you recover. That's where you regenerate. That's where you think of new ideas, et cetera. But the point is to not stay there. It's to feel all the varying levels between one and 10 throughout life. And, and, you know, you're talking to entrepreneurs and creatives and people are, you know, pushing the boundaries and limits in their own life. Like if you're in that moment, if you're thinking about building something, if you're starting that company, like it's hard, man. Like it is freaking hard. No one's going to hand you that financial reward. You know, the, the, the five trophies that are sitting behind your head here, you know, without going through some of those ones, without being like, I'm starting this business. I'm staking myself in this business. I'm raising money. Uh, oh shoot. I hired the wrong person and I lost, you know, this, whatever we've all been there. Right. Like that's part of it. Like, but that's actually part of it. And that's actually what makes it rich too. Because when you get handed that trophy or you, you have this achievement or whatever that doesn't have to be achievement oriented, you look back and you go, oh, right. I got here because I was willing to push, to struggle, to challenge myself. And that concept is a, a primary concept in my book, The 12 Hour Walk, which is ways in which people can take themselves out of their own comfort zone to actually stretch themselves and, and really flex and develop their minds so that they can embrace those ones to ultimately have those tens rather than living a life stuck in the zone of comfortable complacency. I cannot wait. You've mentioned a few times. I can't, we're going to get into the 12 hour walk because it's one of the most curious things to me. Um, but before we do, I just have to ask, do you think people live in the four fives and sixes because it's safe or, and, and maybe they want the tens, but can we get the tens without embracing the ones? And so that's where I think, I think that people in their minds live in the four and six and they're thinking, I want more tens. I want more tens, but they go, but I don't want any ones. Right. That's what it is. Right. So and they're so, so like, risk adverse of, so the risk one, adverse. Of, of putting themselves there, of looking like an idiot, of fearing other people's judgments, of losing a lot of money, of whatever it is, like just that breakdown, terrible moment where frankly, all of the growth tends to come because it's painful enough, right? Like it's a, right. It's a painful experience to be there. But you think most people would rather live in mediocrity than 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 even taste either version of these extremes? Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, I could use a ton of examples, but since we're on the topic of business and entrepreneurship, it's like you get that first job out of college and you like, you're like, I don't even like like this career or like even what I do every single day, but it's like paying the bills and it covers my rent. And maybe it's some sort of like, you know, semi-prestigious thing. Oh, I work at X fill in the blank big company. And so you can say that at a cocktail party and someone's like, Great, you work at Google or Adidas, you know, whatever, you know, this bank or something like that or whatever, you know, whatever That's that significance, is. Significance, right? Yeah, you know, it's just kind of like, okay, like good, good for you, you know? But every single day you're sitting in your cubicle or whatever and you're like, I don't like this. But the thing is the next step to not like this is have to walk into the next cocktail party and say like, I don't know, man, I'm unemployed. I'm trying to figure it out. Or I have this random startup for X widget that I have no idea how I'm going to actually build or whatever. And like have these sleepless nights, you're going to end up working harder for less money in the short run. If you want to build your idea, any entrepreneur will tell you that, right? So you have to leave the safety of that four to six range where it's like, Yep. Salary, 401k, like what I mean, again, I can make a million examples, but in the frame of business and entrepreneurship, that is what that is. But in the end, and I actually opened the 12 hour walk with a, a story about a, a room that I was in with eight billionaires. You know, these guys are CEOs of big banks, hedge fund managers, et cetera. 
and a, an 80 year old man pulls me aside at the end of the night after having a dialogue about Everest and dreams and things like that. And he pulls me aside and he goes, you know, Colin, you know, I've made more money than you'd ever dream imagine possible, but there's not a day that I don't go back to my adolescence and think about the simplicity. He was describing a moment at summer camp. He was like, I was on a lake. I was on this boat. I was outside. And he goes, I wish I had had the gumption to ask myself at inflection points in my life, what do I really want? And I have this question, what's your Everest? My Everest was to climb Mount Everest. He goes, I wish I had asked myself this question because I've climbed a lot of big mountains and I've been heaped on a bunch of praise, but he was just offering regret. And he goes, I'm 80 years old now. And I think I missed it. I think I missed it. And this is a guy, and this guy's saying it's like a freaking, you know, billionaire. Yeah, it's it's, Rosebud. Guy, it's right? Citizen right? Kane right yeah. there. The dude just wants his sled. Right. And so, you know, I think there, there's no right answer to that question. What's your Everest? And the point is to not vilify money. It could be to make millions of dollars. It could be impact millions of lives. It could be lean into your family and your community. It could mean there's a million answers to that. The mediocrity of retirement, about that four to six, like more often that happens when you start living somebody else's life or somebody else's projection of what you think you should be doing, or, you know, it's just good enough. And I like to say good enough isn't good enough. Not good enough for me, not good enough for you. Like stretch yourself. But in stretching yourself, it requires a challenge. This is a silly metaphor. You're sitting around your house. You go, oh man, our kitchen hasn't been updated in 20 years. We want to do a kitchen remodel. We want granite countertops, we want new appliances, whatever. You're like, great. Everyone knows the next step that you do is you rip out the sink, you rip out the tile, you don't have plumbing for a week, you know, whatever that is. Like, you don't just snap your fingers and you get the 10, right? You don't just get the finished product of what you want. You actually have to regress. You actually have to be like, yep, if you want a kitchen remodel for a month, it's going to suck. I mean, it's a silly metaphor, but it, it, it's uh, appropriate it's, it's here, per- right? It's a perfect metaphor because <laughs> we want all the gains without any of the sacrifice, right? Correct. So you've mentioned it a bunch of times. And, and, and so the 12-hour walk uh, is, your, is your latest book. And it's the idea that you're going to spend time alone. And your version of alone is like, not just alone, because I spend a lot of time alone, but, but without your phone, without podcasts, without books, without technology, without other people, without conversations, without the dog, without the kids, without anything. First of yeah. all, like, wh- why did you write this book? And how did you come across this idea that, that walking for 12 hours is, is good for you? Yeah. So, you know, I gave a quick origin story and, and kind of you, know, you, you summed up the, the point. It's ultimately the book is an invitation for people to take a 12 hour walk of their own. But I'll, I'll frame that a little bit, which is when I was crossing Antarctica to stay in front of Captain Lou to not run out of food, even though I was on like my last bite of food when I finished 12 hours had to become my, my daily routine. At first, I thought I could never pull it more than 10, but I had to shift that up to 12. And for 54 days in a row, I pulled my sled 12 hours a day. And I had deleted pretty much all my music, my podcast, et cetera, and spent you know the majority of that time in complete silence and stillness of my mind with the thesis. I believed that at first it would be harder. You know, of course, oh, give me a podcast, give me an audio book, give me whatever to like occupy my mind. But I thought that actually over time, it might be, it might be easier. Meaning like if I could find these flow states, these like places of peace and stillness in my own mind, that time would actually become somewhat ephemeral that like, you know, minutes would go by and hours, you know, et cetera. Um, and that happened. I mean, don't get me wrong. Those first few days, I was like, man, this was a stupid idea. I kind of wish I had kept all the music on there. Um, but there, there ended up being these moments as my body quite literally broke down. My mind got stronger and stronger and stronger. And by the end, I found myself in just these deep flow states, these places in my mind where I felt inner peace. I felt deep connection to what I call, you know, infinite love, um, you know, connection to family uh, and, and spirit, you know, whatever, however you define that in your own life, but just these places of sort of bliss and flow state where I would could pull my sled for 12 hours. And it like, wasn't that big of a deal. I'm in Antarctica starving, pulling a sled, but I found these places where I could just, I could just do it and exist. Um, and very, very powerful. And so when I got back from Antarctica, I thought, wow, I learned this lesson. How amazing I can apply this in many different things. And I did apply that. And a number of things went well. My first book, The Impossible First, uh, which is about Antarctica, you know, became a New York Times bestseller. I did another big, huge project where I did this rope. I rode a boat across Drake Passage, the most dangerous stretch of ocean in the world. And Discovery Channel did this, you know, big multi-million dollar documentary around it. You know, all sorts of things were going extremely well for me professionally. Um, and that my mindset just was, it felt unflappable. And then COVID hits. And I find myself just like we all did in the spring of 2020, you know, locked in uh, my house. Uh, at the time I was, I was on the Oregon coast with my wife uh, and my dog. And 
I lost that mindset, man. Like I, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm like doom scrolling the news. I'm like, you know, everyone, oh, the borders are closing. What about my parents? Are they going to be okay? Grandparents, you know, as if people are dying, you know, I just like, I think a lot of people had this experience. Our routines are completely disrupted. Our lives are completely disrupted. I'm locked inside. Um, and I'm just full of anxiety, doubt, fear, depression, just like, I mean, completely the opposite of what I just described in Antarctica. And at one point my wife looks over at me and she's like, you know, Colin, you haven't really changed out of your pajamas in three or four days. You've just been sitting there on the couch, like just staring at your social media feed, updating the news, whatever, like, you know, just a gentle nudge. Like you want to do something to, you know, kind of, you know, get out of this funk. And so I thought back in that moment to when I last felt the deepest inner peace. And I was like, weirdly enough, it's in Antarctica, these 12 hour days pulling my sled, you know, despite how challenging that was, that's actually where I felt the most kind of at peace in my mind. So I said to my wife, I said, you know, I'm going to go uh, for a walk uh, tomorrow. I'll be gone all day. You know, um, just I'll, I'll probably be back around dinner time. And she's like, okay, have fun, whatever. So I walk out my front door the next day. And as I'm walking out my front door, 20 minutes in or something, my phone buzzes in my pocket. Buddy of mine's texting me. And I pull up my phone, I'm about to text him back. And I think to myself, I stop myself, I'm like, what am I doing? I mean, sitting here on my couch, doom scrolling the news. Now I'm texting my friend while I'm out. Like, what am I doing? Like, and I put my phone on airplane mode and I continue walking. And I walk. 12 hours that day, you know, I take breaks. It's not like I'm trying to go a certain distance or anything like that. I stop, I sit down, I reflect, but I maintain my solitude and silence the entire walk. And I walk back in the front door of my house, Oregon coast, my dog jumps up on my lap. My wife says to me, she goes, you're back. And I said, yeah, yeah. I told you I was coming back around dinner. And she goes, no, no. She leans in. She goes, you're back. Like she could just see this like shift, uh, you know, in my psyche and my being. And she was right. You know, I had this, this reset, what was hugely valuable for me. I kind of regained that composure, but I didn't think this was applicable to necessarily broadly applicable. I was like, great. I'm the guy who walked across Antarctica in silence. So I turn off my phone. I go for a long walk. I feel better. Like, great. But as COVID you've went kind on, of, you've kind of made a living walking. Great. Literally. <laughs> I'm like the guy who walks far. Um, and so I say to my, uh, you, know, you know, over the next co- couple of weeks or whatever, I think as we probably all did, People in my community, friends, family members, colleagues, et cetera, are not doing great during COVID. And so I just say like, you know, I did this thing last Saturday or whatever, and I went for this 12 hour walk. And I tell people, I was like, I don't care how far you go. It's not about distance. It doesn't matter if you go for one mile or 50 miles. It doesn't matter, you know, but it's about taking a day to be alone in silence. And before I knew it, dozens of people started taking me up on this 12 hour walk idea. Even like my 77 year old mother-in-law at, you know, at the time, she, she, uh, she takes a 12 hour walk by walking one time around her block in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, then sitting on her, her porch um, in silence by herself and then taking another walk around her block. My ultra marathon friend does like 45 miles or something like that in, in a day. And truly neither one of them is doing it better or worse than the others. And so as people started having this, they would come back. And the one thing they all had in common was they felt renewed. They felt refreshed. They felt their mind was stronger than it had been in years, if ever. Um, and so the 12 hour walk, the, the book itself, uh, like I said, is about mindset. It's about these limiting beliefs we put on ourselves. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I'm not strong enough. What if I fail? And it breaks that those sort of limiting beliefs down in a rich storytelling way, you know, taught through the lens of different expeditions I've been on and, and exciting, you know, kind of edge of your seat storytelling. But I have quintessentially say in the book, I'm like, I'm not the hero of this book. You, the reader, the listener of the audiobook, you know, you're the hero of the story. This is a book that's hopefully inspiring you to take this 12 hour walk of your own. Don't just take my word for it. The walk itself is a lived and felt experience. And so, my goal was to inspire 10 million people to take this 12 hour walk. The book's been out for a couple months. I've already had, I don't know what it is now, 10,000 plus people who have done this walk, you know, 30 or 40 different countries, every single continent. People participate in this walk. It's free, it's outside your front door. Like, I don't get a dollar for every person who does the walk. It's just that I'm I am inspired to have people have the shift and this change and to take that one day, you know, the book obviously goes into preacher detail about this, but to one day to commit to this stillness, this silence, this reflection um, has just been, you know, exponentially powerful for a wide swath of people. Um, and it's fun to continue to spread that message and ultimately spawn this global movement. I love that so much because when I, when I first heard you describe this, I was thinking about the fact that it's like, well, you know, I was a few weeks ago, I was in Florida for a conference. Guess what? Our conference got canceled because it was in Tampa and a hurricane came. Yeah. So I found myself not having a place to stay. <laughs> right. It's like four day conference. I'm supposed to fly out of Orlando five days later. Person comes up on stage and goes, like, guys, conference is canceled. Everyone has to leave immediately. 
And I'm going like, <laughs> my flight is in for four or five days from now. Where am I supposed to go? And so I went to, my family has a condo on the other side of the state. I, so I drive alone to the other side of the state. And frankly, I spend a bunch of days alone. And I, I ran on the beach and um, I, I exercised and I worked on deep work. But, and so immediately I thought of that. I thought of like how great it was to just have a schedule that's normally full, suddenly cleared, be able to spend time on the beach, spend time working, spend time reading, spend time listening. But then I realized like I still didn't meet anywhere near your criteria hmm. because you want us to spend 12 hours without the books, without the podcast, without the music, without any of those other things. And I was thinking, gosh, when was the last time that I spent that much time silent or alone? And I don't think I've probably spent more than an hour or two yeah. ever silent and alone. And it would typically be like driving home after a long day where I just couldn't have the energy or the mindset to like listen to a podcast, listen to a book, listen to music. And I would just drive home in silence and just kind of think through things. But normally, or I might go for like a long 10K run or something um, in silence without any music on. But normally, I can't imagine myself giving myself enough time to spend 10 or 12 hours with it. What would you suggest is the difference? Because I think most people are like me. We might spend half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, two hours alone. What's the difference between this kind of like micro time, which I, I love, I agree it's really healthy, and spending like a full 12 hours? Like, what's the difference? Yeah, I mean, there's a few things. And, and that, those are all really great points. You know, <clears throat> what I found is, you know, a couple of things. One for 12 hours for most people, yourself included, myself, obviously in my typical life. Yeah, yeah, it, it seems crazy. Way, <laughs> way, way beyond, way, way, way beyond what anyone ever does, if ever, right? Like most people I suggest this to, they're like, they say the same. Well, the most I've spent in silence is a half hour, hour, maybe when I my phone died sometime or whatever. And so it is to, to break for a day, to break through your regular routine. You know, talking about those, you know, those five days, like this might be great. This might be awful, but you're going to remember it. If I ask you, you go and do this. I ask you five years from now, have you ever walked far? You're probably like, you're there. Actually, there was this time I turned off my <laughs> phone and did this, right? It's an actual, it's a new experience. But more so what I find that happens for people is, is a couple of things. One, in the moment that is, even is this being suggested, you're listening to this, you know, or listening to our conversation right now, it's just being suggested. Your mind can't help but consider it. You can't help but consider it. You're going to yourself, should I do this? Shouldn't I do this? And it's me holding up a mirror to your own internal dialogue in this moment, because most people start bargaining with themselves. Well, it's kind of interesting. The guy has some cool stories, but I got a busy life. I don't have enough time for this. Or like, oh, I, I hate being uncomfortable. I wouldn't remember my feet that long, whatever. And what I find is those same limiting beliefs that pop up in this moment, even just being suggested to it are quite often the same limiting beliefs that are on loop in your brain over and over again that are likely holding you back from a number of other things. So by actually committing to the 12 hour walk and putting it on your calendar, you know, I have a website, it's completely free to sign up, it takes you 10 seconds, but you commit, you say, I'm going to do it on this date. That is, that triggers something else in your brain. Oh, now I've committed to something. Now I have some accountability. I, you know, me, I have some emails that I'll, I'll be your accountability partner in your email inbox. Like you're three days away from your 12 hour walk. You know, yeah. here's some tips and tricks to think through, you know, FAQs, things so, like so that. So can I, can I, yeah. I, I love this idea that your immediate reaction is the story you're telling yourself. So when I first heard this, it wasn't that I can't schedule a day off because I can. It wasn't that I can't walk for 12 hours or even, even in a limited function, like take a walk, take a break, take a walk, whatever that I can do. I can bring some water or I can fast or I can figure like all the logistics I could figure out. The immediate thing I thought of is I don't think me taking the time to do this is as important as everything else I need to do. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, my, my limiting self-belief then or the story I'm telling myself is that I guess I have so many things that I have to do. It's just, you know, I'm not important enough to warrant setting some clients aside or setting some work aside or putting my kids aside or whatever it is to give myself that, that day. And it's not even a fear of judgment or anything. It's just like, I have so many important things to do. Yeah. So, so help yeah, me I'll, figure this I'll out. What's the, what's yeah, the, what's the self-belief on that? And yeah. I'll respond to that. And then the previous question as well, which is, so there's the part of my book that I write about this concept. And I say, you know, this common misbelief, I think, is that self-care is somehow selfish, right? That you're, you know, like, oh, I shouldn't do this because like you said, I have clients, I have, you know, family, I have these other things to take care of. 
But every person that does find the time to do the 12 hour walk, I just literally was facilitating a call with a group of um, prominent CEOs around the world that just just did this 12 hour walk. And these are people who are busy, busy people running huge companies. Like, and when I suggest this, they're like, you're crazy, but they, I got them all to buy in and they did it. Like, I didn't think I could take a day. And they come back as a week after they've done their walk at this point, we're doing this facilitation call and they're saying, wow. I'm more present with my clients. I'm more present with my kids. I'm more you know, active as a father. I'm actually have new ideas that I haven't had in a long time. So the point being is we have this idea that it's somehow selfish, but actually self-care is selfless, right? It's like, you're, you're, you don't want to sacrifice your clients, but ultimately your clients want you to show up as the best version of yourself. Your kids certainly want you to show up as the best version of yourself. Do you miss one of their soccer games? If you have to take a Saturday to do this? Yes. And it's a bummer that you missed that one goal that your kids scored for sure. But if that means for the next five years, you're going to have reprioritized your mind, your body, your soul in a way that makes you show up more consistently as that, then that's, that's a better win. And so it feels like a big sacrifice in the short run. But what I found, because so many people have done this and shared their feedback with me, is they said like, oh, wow, that wasn't me putting my life on hold. That was me accelerating my dedication to the rest of my life every other day on the backside of this. And so you had said you had said one other thing before, which is what was the difference between sort of a one hour time of silence versus a 12 hour time of silence, you know, that, you know, that. And what I find for people is that, and I'm, every time I do the 12 hour walk, I try to do it quarterly. Uh, same thing for me is the first hour or two, like I'm in still in that monkey mind like place. Like I'm in that like, okay, I got that to-do list and I got to do that thing more. And oh, when I get back, I can make sure I send that email. And, you know, just like kind of in that, you know, what I would call sort of surface level you know, decision-making. And there's something about the walking and being outside and engaging the silence that, you know, hour three or four, you get a little bit deeper, hour five or six, you get a little bit deeper. But most people say, even though, again, similar to me in Antarctica, your body at some point, even like I said, take as many breaks as you want. Don't you have to train for this? This meets you right where you're at. But usually after hour 10, like you're kind of like, I'm tired, man. Like my feet hurt or like I'm hungry or, you know, I'm thirsty, whatever that is, you know, bring food, bring water, et cetera. But people more often than not have the deepest breakthroughs about the real stuff about their heart, about their passion, about their creativity, about love, family, you know, sort of the deeper things. They've gotten past that stage of the, the to-do list and that monkey mind. Those things seem to come out, you know, in hour 10, hour 11, hour 12. And, and the goal isn't to, you know, doesn't crack people in some way, but there's there's a lot of tough masculine guys that are sending feedback like, wow, man, I was bawling my eyes out for the last hours and this just like cathartic release. Or I had this the most creative idea that it's this thing I want to pursue. And I was so lit up by this moment. But that happened in, you know, I told myself, I have 10 hours, I've done enough of this, but that happened in hour 11 and a half, right? And so there's something, this exponential sort of benefit that happens as you get deeper and deeper into this and quite long, quite literally deeper and deeper into your mind and spirit uh, as this thing goes. And it's not something that's realistic to do every single day. So integrating that 12 hours and then bringing it back in your day, like, okay, what's my 15 minute routine to kind of, you know, whether that's a meditation or, you know, just walking in silence for 15 minutes around your block to clear your mind. But it's th this, this is meant to be an intentional day of really setting everything aside and going deep in your mind for the full 12 hours. I love it. I'm going to do it. Like <clears throat> as soon as I heard it, I was already like, okay, I'm going to do this. I, I just have to I have to schedule it. <laughs> yeah, put it on the put it on the calendar. Like I said, go on, go on the website, pick a day. It's so funny, you know. You and I both know this from all the things we do, and it's like it's one thing. Oh, one day I'm going to do this. It's another thing. To be like I'm doing this, whether it's eight weeks from now, December nineteenth. I'm doing this. It's yeah. like there's something like in your mind that's which like okay, I'm committed to it. You know. So I, I always it's one of the reasons I set up the, the I mean the website twelvehourwalk.com has lots of information FAQs. People are you know how do I go to the bathroom? Where do your shoes start bringing? Whatever. It's a lot of questions that answers that. But it also is literally you know a box you fill out that says you know I call him a Brady. I'm doing the twelve hour walk on October thirty first on this time whatever. And it's just something about that boom you know that that consistency. So I have to ask, I mean, you've done a ton of badass things from going to the North Pole to the South Pole to climbing all of the major mountains to doing just like, you know, crazy stuff. But you've also, I mean, gone on Jimmy Fallon and Joe Rogan and had the press, the New York Times and everyone talk about you. Is it harder to walk a thousand miles alone in, in the Arctic or to deal with the press? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the media is an interesting, you know, place, um, you know, the, you know, over, overwhelmingly so has been really, you know, positive, um, you know, been able to 
you know, there's, I think eight front page New York times articles written about me through the course of my Antarctica crossing. And as you mentioned, you know, I've been on Fallon and, you know, all the big television shows and big podcasts and stuff like that. And it's been a, an amazing way to connect with people broadly, right. The world that we live in, it's pretty amazing that, you know, you can sit in front of a microphone. Sure. 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 That's all yeah. the, that's no, all no, the nice politically say, correct answer, but was it fun? <laughs> I, you know, I, more for the most part, I've, I've loved it, you know, cause something like the 12 hour walk. And I, I have thought about this, right. I'm like, I'm passionate about this idea and I'm passionate about this idea because I just, it actually is every person that I've met who have done the 12 hour walk has taken something, has implemented something in their life. And as I say, in the subtitle of the book, unlock the steps to their best life, unlock their best life. Um, and that's the world I want to live in where people like your audience are creating and, and inventing and pushing themselves passionately um, by, by doing hard things. Right. Um, and I, and I love that. I love the spirit of that and the media, social media, media, et cetera, um, has allowed any person to reach obviously more people, you know, are there, you know, sure. Like you mentioned, there's, you know, a couple of negative articles and the sea of thousands of great articles have been written about me, you know, things like that, you know, that stuff never feels great. Um, but I, the way I look at it is, you know, I, I think that you've probably familiar with it, but the, the Teddy Roosevelt quote, you know, the man in the arena, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's not the critic who counts, um, but the man actually standing in the arena with dust and, you know, blood dried on their face. That's a paraphrase. Of course, he certainly says it more perfectly than I did there. Um, but I'm a believer of that, which is like, you know what? Like the only reason that somebody is criticizing you is because you actually did something because you actually <laughs> dared to dream to get out of your couch because you got out of that zone of comfortable complacency. Like I, I remember, you know, what, you know, like I said, there's been so many positive articles, very few negatives. It was like one negative article comes out. I remember I got a flood of text messages from people that literally said, Congrats from successful people that I admire. Congratulations. You've actually made it. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's a <laughs> shitty day. Right. And they're like, they're like, you've done something noteworthy enough that people now want to have opinions about it on both sides of the thing about, you know, who walked further or better or whatever BS, you know, if you want to like that, it's like, so to me, like name the person that has achieved greatly or has dared greatly, or has changed the world or has had massive impact that has like, nobody has had any opinion about it ever. It's like that, that's irrelevance and obscurity. And so again, just in that same essence of embracing the ones, you know, the media is a funny thing, you know, for the most part, the media has been great to me, has been allowed myself to, to spread the message that I'm passionate about spreading about, you know, positivity and uplifting folks. Mm -hmm. And the rest of that is just, you know, part of the game uh, and, and a little bit of the, uh, like I said, I'd rather be the man in the arena than the person sitting there, you know, talking about, well, if I had gone, to, I'm never going to Antarctica, but if I had, it would be more like this, like, okay, man, whatever. <laughs> I love it. Final question for you. At the end of the day, what does it all come down to? What does it all come down to? Um, I guess I could take that question in a lot of different directions, but I'll answer it by this is I, I fundamentally believe that the most important muscle any of us have is the six inches between our ears, our minds, right? And I use that word muscle very intentionally in this context because, you know, we think about our biceps, you want big biceps, you want to be jacked, you go to the gym, you lift the weights. And too often we don't think of our minds that way. And I really fundamentally believe that we can have the washboard abs of our minds or the big biceps or whatever, but you got to put the reps in. You got to find ways to cultivate um, and, and challenge and strain and stress and to build up your mind. And when you do that, I think that the possibilities are truly limitless.